Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Inside Israel. It is the week of October 9th, 2024. This is episode 51, entitled Joel's Dilemma. And before we get on to the episode itself, I do want to do a couple of pieces of business. First of all, I want to remind you that tomorrow I'm conducting a special session in commemoration of the one-year anniversary of the October 7th attacks. The session is called A Year in Hebrew Words. I know many educational institutions are probably doing sessions tomorrow, and I would imagine that many of them are taking the same take, sort of assessing where Israel is right now, how has the country changed since last October 7th, what's different, what is the future going to hold, and those are all really important, no question. I did want to take sort of a different angle, though, as many of you know, uh, I love Hebrew words, and I think Hebrew words offer a lot of insight into values and ethics and who we are as human beings, human nature. Hebrew seems to know us better than we know ourselves, I tend to think. And so what I decided to do was to look at five Hebrew words that, when we examine them, can actually shed light on what it's meant to live in Israel, to be Israeli now, Uh, what we've been going through for the past year, and not just us Israelis, but really Jews around the world and people who care about Israel all around the world. So I chose five Hebrew words. It's going to be a a short session, about 30 minutes, maybe even less. You do need to register for this, so it's unlike these weekly Inside Israel broadcasts. You do need to actually get a link, put your email address. It's just uh, for security reasons, plus we're opening it up to a much larger audience. So I'm going to put that link in the chat right now. If you haven't done so already, uh, either now or at the very end, go ahead and register for that. It's going to be at 2 p.m. Eastern time. That's 11 a.m. Pacific tomorrow, which is 9 p.m. here in Israel. The second is I want to thank all of those of all of those out there in the audience who've already donated to the fall fundraiser to help raise funds for Inside Israel. It's free. Inside Israel is free, and I always want to keep it that way. Many, many of you have stepped up to the plate. I'm more than halfway to the goal of $10,000, which is what it costs roughly to produce this podcast for a year. Uh, I'll put the link to donate at the very end of the podcast. But for right now, a big thank you to all who've already given My intention is to write an email to each of you individually. I haven't gotten to it yet. It's been a crazy week. I can always blame, you know, a ballistic missile attack from Iran on uh, any to-dos that I haven't gotten to on my to-do list. So that's one reason I haven't gotten to that yet. But truly, I thank you and really love and appreciate the support. All right. Now on to this week's episode, again, entitled Joel's Dilemma. So what does that title mean? Well, it's very reflective of how I actually feel as the host of this podcast. You know, on the one hand, I really want to bring you a taste of how magical this country is. I mean, I uprooted my life eight years ago, took my four kids out of their American schools, out of our nice American home with a driveway and a basketball hoop and a large backyard. And my wife, of course, who's a Sabra Israeli, and we moved here to Israel. So I love this place, and I wouldn't be here if I didn't truly love this place, not just the place itself, but also what it stands for and also the values that you adopt, whether you want to or not, when you live in Israel, and the values that your children naturally absorb by being raised in Israeli culture. I wouldn't be here if I didn't love the country. And part of what I really want to do is communicate that love to you. That's why I wrote the book, Israel 201. It's one of the reasons why I started this podcast. So at the heart of all of this is a real love for the magic of Israel that I want to share with the audience. At the same time, I want to be completely honest. I never want to sugarcoat anything. The book, Israel 201, you know, it says in the preface that one reason I wrote that book with Benji is that we wanted to give you a pure version of Israel, the good and the bad. It's not a Disneyland, uh, you know, utopia vision of what Israel is, which is what a lot of American Jewish institutions have taught since I was a kid and maybe are doing so a bit less now, but that's always been sort of the way to teach Israel, just glorified, perfect. I wanted to communicate 
the good and the bad. And that's what I want to do in this podcast as well, is communicate the challenges and the rough sides. The thing is, right now, at this particular moment, the week of October 9th, but we can also say the week of October 7th, 2024, I feel more pessimistic than ever. And it's really hard for me to say that because I want to be upbeat. I want to be the guy who brings you good news about Israel and who makes you feel warm in your hearts about the country we all care for. But right now, if I'm going to tell you the truth, I feel more pessimistic than I ever have about the country. Long term, you know, we're talking maybe 40, 60 years down the road, I do feel optimistic. So if Israel were a stock that I were holding for the next 60 years, I would definitely buy right now. No problem. I do feel optimistic about this country in the long, long run, partly because I have no choice. Like you have to be, if you love Israel, you have to believe things will work out. But in the short run, and when we're saying, you know, 20, 30, 40 years, another way of saying that is in my lifetime, right? So for my lifetime, it's very hard for me to feel optimistic. And it pains me to say that, but I want to explain why, that I'm not just saying this as a general feeling, but I want to give you some specifics of, of why I feel kind of pessimistic right now. Let's wait, wait, let's not mince words. Very pessimistic right now. So number one, Gaza. Let's start with the hostages. There's really no reason to believe right now that the hostages are coming home. If someone has a reason, I'd love to hear it. If someone can really give me a well-thought-out, reasoned explanation for how the hostages would come home, probably about 50 to 60 living hostages at this point, I would, of course, love to hear it. But right now, I can't really fathom that. And I'm not alone in this. A lot of Israelis can't. For one thing, you can say, deal, we should be making a deal, Bibi should be trying harder, but let's put that aside for now. Who are we talking to on the other side? Who is the negotiating partner who wants something in return for giving up the hostages? The head of Hamas in Gaza, who's now also the head of Hamas politically, uh, Sinwar, he hasn't been heard from in a very long time. There has been speculation that he's been killed. The greater chance is that he's still alive, but just in hiding. But there was a piece, I believe it was in the New York Times today or yesterday, about how if he is alive... Sinwar has kind of come to the conclusion that he is not going to survive this war in Gaza. And really, he has no motivation at this point to give up the hostages. In a way, you could say that we are, we Israel, might be a victim of our own success, that we have done such a good job dismantling the military wing of Hamas, which no longer is a military wing. According to the army, it's a guerrilla organization operating in pockets, but no longer unified. And we've destroyed 90% of Gazan infrastructure. That at this point, there really is no one to talk to. And there's no one who believes they can get anything good, good enough to give up the hostages they're holding on to. Even if there were, I highly doubt that there's anyone who knows where the hostages are. From what I've read and have talked to people, it seems to me that the hostages are being held in different locations, whether it's tunnels or apartments of private families or apartments of professionals, including journalists and doctors. We've heard that. But there's no real unified network of the hostages to know that we could get them all in one place and get them all out. It seems like they've just been scattered throughout Gaza and that no one's really minding the store to know where they are, that they could negotiate with us to bring them home. So I find it very, very hard to believe that we would get all or even most of the hostages out. We might get a few out through rescue operations or for the random 
hostage holder who has some sort of deal to make. But in terms of as a movement, getting the hostages out, I'm befuddled as how it can happen. Maybe I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong. I hope there are those who know way more than I do and that I'm just seeing the the shallow picture. But it doesn't really seem to me like there's a reason to believe that they would come home. So that's one reason I'm pessimistic. I also find myself really asking, like, okay, what is next in Gaza? All of our attention right now in Israel is on Lebanon and Iran. We've kind of forgotten about Gaza, but there we still do have troops here. But we don't hear much about what's going on there. What is the day after? What is the future of Gaza? Who would rule it? How would it be built up? How would we trust that the people who live there would not attempt to attack us again? Just because Hamas has been dismantled as a military wing doesn't mean there still aren't enough Hamas members left or people who support them to try to do this kind of a thing again, to be our enemies. And for the first time, here's a big change in me. For the first time, I find myself wondering if maybe it was a mistake to pull out of Gaza in 2005. You know, up until 2005, Gaza was what you would call occupied territory. Not only did we have Israeli soldiers in Gaza, but we had Israeli civilians. It was kind of like the West Bank, where we had little villages within Gaza, like trailer parks almost. And they were the way they were situated in Gaza, it broke up Gaza. It made Gaza non-contiguous, and we had soldiers there. And the occasional Israeli citizen living in Gaza was killed, and the occasional sol more than the occasional soldier was killed. But Israel was safe from Gaza. We weren't hit by rocket attacks because we had these, one could argue, we had these pockets of outposts throughout Gaza. And I'm starting to wonder if maybe this was the right way to go. I've always been very progressive and thought two-state solution and disarm them, but have a state there. And now I'm really pessimistic about that idea of a two-state solution, whether it's Gaza and Israel or Israel and the West Bank. It seems to me that maybe this idea of having civilians, Israeli civilians, Jewish civilians live there in pockets and breaking up the territory, maybe that is the way to go. And I kind of feel stupid that I didn't see that earlier. But it would be very hard to argue right now that the best thing for Israel's future is to have a Gazan state or a West Bank state. And this is a turn I've made because in the earlier versions of this podcast, I talked a lot about how I advocated for a two-state solution. I think I believe I know I believed it then and I was saying what I believed was true. But now a year into October 7th, I no longer do. But given that and given the fact that I don't have another solution, it makes me pessimistic. It makes me think that maybe the best thing to do is to reoccupy Gaza again and allow Jews to live back in and build up those communities. And the best thing we can hope for is just this ongoing presence that keeps Israel safe and where... The occasional civilian and soldier die, but Israel in general doesn't have to withstand having an enemy state against it. So that's number one. Lebanon. I have to wonder where the end game is there right now as well. Very, very short history of Lebanon. And I want to give you, I want to do a, at some point a session where I give you a more general overview of Lebanon. But the very short version of Lebanon is this. And uh, <clears throat> I'm really passionate tonight, so my voice is going quickly. I got to really make sure I drink water enough. Israel goes into Lebanon in 1982 in order to drive out the PLO. They're successful, but Israel ends up staying 18 years because it gets mixed up in the Lebanese civil war. Christians, Shiites, Sunnis, some Sunnis. End of the day, Israel stays there 18 years to the year 2000 in a buffer zone. There's a buffer zone about, I think it's 10 miles, 12 miles into South Lebanon. And by having Israeli soldiers on bases throughout South Lebanon, basically we prevent Hezbollah from approaching the border with Israel and we prevent them from firing rockets into Israel. Occasionally they succeed in doing that, but for the most part, they don't. Now, hundreds, if not thousands of soldiers are killed in Lebanon between 1982 and 2000. So there was a price to pay. And ultimately, the reason we withdrew from Lebanon in the year 2000 was a group called 
four mothers, Arba Imaot. These were four mothers of combat soldiers serving in Lebanon who petitioned the government and they led this whole grassroots movement. And finally, in 2000, Israel pulls out. And I relate to this because I was a soldier in Lebanon in the years 1997 and 1998. 1998 was when I was actually there doing these missions against Hezbollah. The whole point of our being there was to push Hezbollah away from the border. We left in 2000 and all they did was build up their arsenal and start approaching the border. Now there is this UN resolution 1701 which calls for no Hezbollah being close to the Israeli border. They have to be above the Litani River, which I think is 12 miles into Lebanon. However, the United Nations has never enforced that. So for us to think that that's something the world actually would do, we'd be insane to believe that because they haven't. Now, like I said, last year alone, the UN passed, I believe it was eight times the number of resolutions against Israel than it has for the rest of the world combined. The UN, I've come to see, is an anti-Semitic body that really we shouldn't pay much attention to. But in any case, I now have to wonder, where is the end game for Lebanon? And it seems to me that this might be going in the same direction, that we're going to end up where we were in the year 1999, which is Israeli soldiers stationed throughout Lebanon up to the Litani River, fighting Hezbollah there as a way to keep Israel safe. And that we have to accept that the occasional Israeli soldier will die in order to keep Israel safe. Right now, we do have a security zone against Hezbollah, a buffer zone, but it's in Israel. We've evacuated the north with 60,000 Israeli residents not going home because of it. We need to put that buffer zone in the south of Lebanon, not in the north of Israel. The problem is the rest of the world, the UN, who's calling for that also, is not going to back it up, so it might be on us. So I worry in Lebanon, we're making a lot of progress. We're taking out Hezbollah's leaders. We're eliminating their entire hi hierarchy. Uh, we took out their number one, Nasrallah, last week, 10 days ago. And I believe we took out their number two within the last 24 hours. And now, right now, no one wants to take that position because they know that their time is numbered if they were to do it. But that doesn't mean that it would end. That doesn't mean that this is a viable end for Israel. I don't see Hezbollah just raising its hands up and turning in their arms. In a way, they're like cockroaches, where if you kill one, another one comes crawling out of the wall somewhere else. So it seems to me we might be going back to this year 1999 solution where we had Israeli soldiers in Lebanon. And so many were injured and killed during that time that it just pains me to think that that might be where we're heading. So that's another reason why I'm a bit pessimistic. <clears throat> Sorry, very pessimistic. Okay. Iran, number three. Where Where is that headed? Like, what's the end of that situation? On these last two fronts, Lebanon and Iran, it seems to me that the only real long-term solution is a revolution of their own people against these bodies. You know, most Iranians, 80% of Iranians don't want the Ayatollah, are not in favor of the the radical regime that's in power right now. And same with Lebanon. Most civilians don't want Hezbollah to run the country, but they don't have a choice because Iran and Hezbollah, they have the money, they have the power, the, the guns, the weaponry. So they're sort of slaves to their own people. Israel's president Herzog today implored the people of Iran and Lebanon to revolt against their against these governments, against these institutions. I don't know if I see that happening anytime soon. I mean, maybe this is the year that it does. But if it doesn't, it makes me very pessimistic about what the long term, what the long term picture is regarding both Lebanon and Iran. Maybe most concerning of all to me is number four, which is terrorism in Israel itself. You know, overshadowed by the ballistic missile attack from Iran over this past week was that Israel suffered two big terrorist attacks. One was the night of the missile attack from Iran. I believe it was eight people were killed on the subway train. There's a new subway line in Tel Aviv and uh, two terrorists, it turned out they were from the West Bank, from Hebron, were able to get on the train, one with a knife, one with an automatic machine gun, and they started firing and stabbing people on the train. And then when the doors opened, they started just shooting at point blank range and eight people were killed. They're from the West Bank and somehow they got in. We had an attack today at the central bus station in Be'er Sheva in the south. 
where a soldier, a young woman, 19 years old in the Magav unit was shot and killed. And this was by a citizen of Israel, a Bedouin citizen of Israel, who I believe whose brother or cousin had pulled off a similar attack at the same location a few years ago. How do you stop this kind of terrorism from the West Bank and from within our own country? I mean, when you have citizens of your own country who are able to get weapons and pull off terrorist attacks against your own citizens, how do you stop that? I can't think of a solution. I don't know anyone who can. And so it makes me pessimistic. <laughs> it, it, it really does. Uh, I'm pessimistic on that front as well. Now, beyond all that, there are the, the malfunctions that the country, the country continues to suffer. For example, um, thousands of reserve soldiers were given a, it's called the Tzav Shmone. They were called up for re military reserve duty over this past these past few days to go up to the northern border with Lebanon or down to the south to fight in Gaza. However, there was no transportation to get them there because buses and trains don't run on Shabbat and on Rosh Hashanah. So the country, during a time of war, completely overlooked the fact that they all these reserve soldiers needed to get to their bases up north and south to fight by not having any transportation available. Now, at the same time, the minister of transportation, Miri Regev, is on vacation in Hungary. She had to go for business, and she decided to extend her vacation, which is such poor optics for the people of Israel to see this. And she immediately blamed the army for not calling a state of emergency, because had they called a state of emergency, it would have opened up the, the public transport automatically. But these are the things that drive Israelis crazy on a day-to-day -day basis, that in addition to all the external enemies we have to deal with, there's this internal uh, ineptitude that over and over uh, seems to be harming our own chances for making the progress we need. Another reason that this attack happened on the subway in Tel Aviv last week because is because we're short of security guards, not only on that subway line, but in public institutions in general, because so many of our security guards have been called up for reserve duty. So the country is really straining right now. I've heard that we are 10,000 soldiers short of what we need. Meanwhile, as I've said many times, last year alone, 66,000 ultra-Orthodox soldiers who were eligible to be in the army were given exemptions for yeshiva studies. So I do think that 40, 60 years from now, we're going to look back and be amazed at all the chaos we had to suffer through and all the turmoil that we had to endure in order to make the country whole and strong again. But right now, in the short term, this is a very, very hard time to be Israeli and to live here. And that's my dilemma is... I want to communicate that to you, but I don't want to sour you on the country. I don't want you to come away from this podcast thinking, ah, I don't want to listen anymore because he's only bad news, or I don't want to visit anymore or give money to Israeli causes because the country's falling apart. That's not what I'm saying. But I realize I kind of run the risk of doing that, but I want to tell you the truth. And that's really my dilemma. How do I communicate the magic while at the same time telling you what we're really feeling right now? And this is what we're really feeling right now. This is the week of October 7th, one year anniversary. Did we still think that we would have over 100 hostages living and dead still in Gaza a year after? That after all we've gone through, we still would not have gotten them out? That we'd over 700 soldiers would have been killed in addition to those who were killed on October 7th? 700 have died in Gaza and Lebanon so far. That we have residents of the country who've been displaced for a year now. They were displaced on October 8th. And I would love for someone to tell me how it's going to be different in the year to come. But I just, ha I just haven't heard from anyone. And I talk to really smart people. So that's why I'm a little down right now. And that's my dilemma for you is I need to share both of these sides with you. In a moment, we're going to come right back. But let's take a quick break so I can water up.
Welcome back to Inside Israel. Before we go to your questions, I want to quickly address the missile attack from Iran last week. Um, I think in all, it was 180, 188, 190 missiles were fired from Iran. I can't say it was harrowing. Um, we were not taken by surprise. If anything, we knew exactly when it was going to happen and who was going to be targeted. And we went down to our bomb shelters. You know, the sirens began blaring throughout the the, the entire country. If you saw the map of where you needed to go into bomb shelters, it was actually quite comical. It was just red all over. The, the The missiles were targeting all of Israel. But we went down nonchalantly because we knew that our specific area wasn't under attack. We knew that they had communicated ahead of time that they were going to fire, pretty much giving us a chance to shoot them down. In a way, it just felt like a lot of us to, it felt to a lot of us like a game that they had Iran had to show its people and the world that they were strong, but they didn't want to take too much action because God forbid they actually did real damage. We would hit them back really hard. And we just, a lot of us just felt like kind of pawns in a big chess game uh, that was being played by people above us. And so it wasn't necessarily scary down there in the bomb shelter. We went back and forth a few times, but it wasn't pleasant, and I can, was mostly concerned about the kids. You know, our apartment building has a lot of families, and there were plenty of kids down there. And I was just thinking about this is their childhood. This this is the memory they're going to have. Um, to me, the real takeaway, like, again, is just how it just seemed very choreographed. It was weird to know so far ahead of time that this attack was coming. And what kind of missiles would be fired and what our defense against them was going to be. And lo and behold, there really was no damage done. Um, some army bases were hit, but it was minimal, minimal structural damage. Nothing really major. Had they wanted to, could they have hit our electricity grid and knocked it out? Could they have hit our main military base, the Kiria? They could have fired probably five times more missiles, but they didn't because it's calculated. And uh, that's why it really wasn't such a harrowing experience to have to go down to the bomb shelter. It was more just feeling like this was the next step in a game that we didn't know how it was actually going to end, but in the moment wasn't actually doing us major harm. All right, let's go on to your questions. This one is from someone who is uh, wanting to remain anonymous. Let me take a drink of water first, because this is a long question. He or she writes, over the course of these many months, when Israelis in the north have been displaced, not much attention, if at all, has been given in the general news media about the plight of these displaced Israelis. All we hear about constantly is the sad plight of those in Gaza who are repeatedly forced to relocate. Don't get me wrong. I agree that for the many innocents in Gaza, it is a very sad plight. But what about the innocent displaced Israelis? And who is footing what must be exorbitant expenses by now for all those living in hotels throughout the country? So the second part of the question first, it is the government who is footing the bill and they keep passing more legislation to allow for more funding uh, to help keep them in hotels. That's the easy part. The more difficult question is, why is there no coverage of the innocent displaced Israelis? I think the key word there is innocent. I don't think the rest of the world necessarily sees them as innocent displaced Israelis. They might see them as displaced, but they're not they're not poor. They're not in rags. They're not eating out of buckets the way the civilians of Gaza are shown to be in the news. And I've also I'd question how many innocents there are in Gaza. I've made that point many times that there are there are innocents in Gaza, but not as many as we might think. So I think the optics don't really favor the displaced Israeli. You know, even if they were to interview a displaced Israeli, they would see a man or a woman sitting in a hotel lobby with their kids playing, having board games indoors, having a buffet of food behind them. It doesn't look that bad. Now, it is bad. No one should be displaced from their homes. But 
the the carnage, the wreckage, the destruction that you see in Gaza. It's just such a better news story. And it's part of the whole anti-Israel bias that we're seeing over and over. Uh, I wish that weren't the case, but alas, it is. Okay, Bobby wrote in, I spoke with someone yesterday who just got back from Israel. She said that she saw U.S. soldiers in Israel. Please comment. You know, to the specifics, Bobby, I don't know that there are U.S. soldiers in Israel right now. But in general, I do know that it is a thing for U.S. soldiers to do training exercises with Israeli soldiers in Israel. When I was in the IDF, some members of my tank unit went to a, an undisclosed location in Israel and did tank maneuvers with American tank soldiers. We share a lot of technology in our tanks. A lot of the pieces in the Israeli tanks say made in America, made in the USA. So I know that the actual pieces of the tank uh, are made. We share technology both directions. Um, and there, it is often it is often that U.S. servicemen will be in Israel either for training or as part of their, if they're in the Navy, they'll come to port, get off in Haifa and have a few days. Um, so if she saw soldiers here it's it's likely that's true i can't comment on that personally but there is a lot of joint cooperation between the u.s and israeli military i also know that u.s soldiers are big fans of the israeli military uh you know for all you hear in the u.s about maybe anti-israel you will not hear that in the military the u.s military servicemen first of all they know who our enemy really is um and they also know how Israel is really doing the dirty work of the world and so they appreciate that and uh i think they really admire um, how Israeli soldiers train and what we're what we manage to do and what we're doing in Lebanon right now, destroying Hezbollah. Um, and really what we've done in Gaza to Hamas is uh, it, it's quite an achievement in military circles, even if the rest of the world doesn't see it as so. Beth, can I comment on Israel's willingness to agree to a ceasefire for a few weeks to allow for polio vaccinations? So I don't believe there was an actual ceasefire to allow for polio vaccinations, but I think the main point of your question is that, yes, these polio vaccinations were given and Israel had to allow the import of all these vaccines into Gaza and to clear out safe zones so that Gazan children could get them. Look, I'm against polio. We all are. No one likes polio. No one wants any kids to get polio. So let's agree on that. But we have to get back to the other question, which is, why is Israel allowing anything into Gaza, food, fuel, medicine, when we still have hostages there? The minimum should be let hostages out and then you'll get the fuel you need, the food you need, the water, the vaccines. But many in Israel right now are questioning the logic of why we pretty much kept Hamas going because any food and fuel we sent in was siphoned off by Hamas. We have video of this. It's well known. The reason we did it because probably the United States demanded it and we couldn't lose them. But that to me is the real question here is why is anything getting in when, host when hostages are still there? Because getting the hostages out should be the number one priority. And after that, anything can be on the table. So that wraps, wraps up this week's broadcast of Inside Israel. I'm going to put in the chat right now the three links you need to know about. Number one is to sign up for my newsletter, Hebrew is Magic. That's where you can get updates on this podcast and get a Hebrew word into your inbox every week. Tomorrow's session, A Year in Hebrew Words, that's at 2 p.m. Eastern time. You do have to pre-register. That's in commemoration of the one-year anniversary of the October 7th attacks you can sign up right here with that link. And finally, if you want to support the podcast, here's a direct link to the GoFundMe page. Some of you have reached out that you don't want to give there. You want to give to me directly through Venmo or PayPal or credit card. And of course, that's doable as well. Just email me and you can email me on that first address up there, joelchaznoff.com slash podcast. One link I didn't put here is joelchaznoff.com slash shows. I am going on the road beginning October 19th. That's a week from this coming Saturday. I start my three-month tour in the U.S., really all over the country, New York City area, Jersey, Connecticut, Florida, Midwest, Texas. So if you want to catch me on the road, let me know ahead of time. I'd love to hear from you and meet you face-to-face, -face, but that's on the website as well. 
Our broadcast next week, I will be in the U.S., but we're going to stick with the, you know what, for now, I got to think about this. We might do 5 p.m., but we might move it a bit later because I'll be in the U.S. just landing in the United States that day. So stay tuned for the exact time. That will be next Sunday, October 13th, the day after Yom Kippur. Until then, I wish you all a meaningful commemoration of the October 7th attacks this week. Hard to believe we're already one year out and that this is where we are. Join me tomorrow at 2 p.m. if you want that session with me, A Year in Hebrew Words. Until then, only peace, shalom for all of us. Laila Tov, thanks so much for joining, and I will leave the chat open a few minutes more. Litrot.